Hey guys, welcome to The Grey Escape. I hope you've had a great week. I hope you've been checking out some other episodes of The Grey Escape because lately they have been getting really juicy. Holographic universe, healing with sound. It's been so mind-blowing you may not even have a mind left by now. And if so, congratulations. And if not, don't worry. Today's episode will help chisel a little hieroglyphic into your mind to begin its deconstruction. Did you catch that? That was a little clue, a little foreshadowing of today's episode. Here's another clue. Big fucking rocks. I said it. Well, I've got an explicit rating on iTunes, so I can say anything I want. That's why I got the explicit rating. Frankly, I haven't been putting it to very good use. So I'll say it again. Big fucking rocks rocks. There you go. I'll tell you more about them right after this. If you guys checked out last week's episode, Vibrations of Tesla with sound healer Tony Neck, you'll know I got to go to Stonehenge. Well, I also got to go to Totnes. I just went on a little trip to Totnes here in the UK and I stumbled upon a time travel museum and it was as cool as it sounds. So I just wanted to give a shout out to the Time House Museum, which is buried in a little store on the high street in Totnes called Narnia. That's the store, but inside, oh, it's something else. So if you're in the UK, definitely make it a destination, the Time House Museum. Well, I've just time traveled, I'm pretty sure of it, and now I'm in this exact moment with you introducing today's show with a very special guest who knows a lot of stuff. So much stuff that I've broken it up into two distinct episodes. And from my intro, you may have a clue what this episode is about. James Swagger is a very smart guy. He's got a master's degree in engineering, a bachelor's degree in physics with astronomy, a master's degree in science, research and society. Clearly an underachiever. He also has a bajillion followers on YouTube with his various channels, including Capricorn Radio, which you may have heard him on, or maybe you've heard him on Dark Matter Network. So what's his deal? Well, besides hosting his own shows, he's also absolutely obsessed with rocks, not just any rocks, big, well, I don't have to say it again, you know the type of rocks, they're known as megaliths. If you've ever seen a photo of Stonehenge, those are megaliths and they're all over the world. And the mystery is, why are they there and who put them there? Well, if anyone has a clue, it's James Swagger. So here we go, complete with his spectacularly brilliant Irish accent. His researcher, engineer, and YouTube success story, James Swagger. I think you're the first person podcasting also that I've met. I think that's why I'm so excited as well. And you're so successful at it, you know. I am successful. Yes, you are. I actually became more (laughs) successful at the podcasting than I did as an author. And it eclipsed everything I did, Natalie. And it broke my heart because that's not what I set out to do. And I don't know, I'm a shrewd businessman too. I don't look a gift horse in the mouth and say, no, I'm not going to take that chance. So I still was pursuing passions and history. And I said, the rest will follow. And now I'm at the tables are turning and I'm coming back around and getting the successful thing as the author as well on the tours and on everything I'm trying to promote and, and for megaliths and stuff like that as well. But I have a foot in both worlds. And you know what? I did it all the right way. Uh, I did I did it all the right way. I did I rose to the challenge and I did it that way. But yeah, I mean, podcasting's a difficult thing and I love it. And I love people like you, Natalie, coming and rising to the challenge as well because I was there before, you know, and I, I remember about 30 episodes. It actually changed for me about the same time as you. I had about 30 episodes under my belt and I, and I realized something very, very deep was that people are hungry for knowledge and they don't want nonsense. They want something that's real. And they want some truth and they want some knowledge and they want a bit of humour as well. And I like what you do, Natalie. And that's Thank what, you. Yeah. Um, and I know we, we, we have a mutual friend, Anthony uh, Peake, as well. And uh, Anthony's a lovely soul. And I live for podcasts like that. When I meet somebody like Anthony Peake or Graham Hancock or Robert Boval, and they inspire something in you or they, there's a transfer of knowledge. 
and people listen to that real on air and that's why I do it I, 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 all of my shows are great I like I do them I wouldn't do a show if I didn't want to do it but I sometimes I, I gel with somebody or I even find out information on shows that I didn't even know and it's like the information comes to me as well so it's a wonderful thing and it's a lifestyle to me now yeah um, and, it, and, it, and it enhances everything that I'm doing anyway in an overall picture line so did you have a normal life before you were this giant <laughs> YouTube star? I, ne I never had a normal life, Natalie, <laughs> ever. And my father, allow me to meet my father first of all, this is very interesting. My father's an engineer as well. And uh, he had me at the age of six building radio transmitters. Um, and I understood math. My father's not a mathematician. He's a left-handed guy. He's a healer. He's a hypnotist. Uh, he hypnotized people for asthma conditions and... Uh, not religious in any way, but he used a cross, and when they had an asthma attack, they would press the cross against the skin, and it would be psychosomatic. He never believed in anything like that, but it's a psychosomatic thing. So he used to teach people this, and uh, he had a very high success rate healing people with asthma in the north of Ireland. And um, So this is my father figure uh, growing up. Uh, he also plays musical instruments by ear, and wow. to me, that is, he like, picks up a guitar, a keyboard, accordion. He doesn't even know what a chord is. He, he couldn't even tell you what a chord is. He just knows and it's a number of notes put together. But I mean, he, he sounds like such a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a jerk Healing people, him. playing music. music. God. But, uh, this, is, this is my father. And, and he was an entrepreneur of 15 businesses. Five of them were successful wow. as well. And, but he is an engineer. That's his trade. And he sounds amazing. Your dad he sounds is amazing. amazing. And, and I, I, I just thought this was my normal. This is everybody's father figure. You know, everybody does this. And. He, he, he seen something in me because I was the only one to take up the electrical, electronics and the mechanical, everything he did like. Um, the other two brothers went into technician roles and electrical and electronic engineering and uh, my whole family's engineers. But I took to it all and everything he threw at me, I soaked it up and I loved radio transmitters. I got an obsession with it and, an, and I, that's what got me into engineering. And he understood that I knew the academia and the math and the, and the equations, which, by the way, if you don't know electronic engineering or radio frequency electronics is the least done part of electromagnetic uh, or electro engineering. It's, people just don't want to touch it because it's so complex and the math is difficult. It's like physics. Nobody wants to do the quantum physics. They mm. want, want to do other types of physics. But I just want to talk about the cool stuff, like black holes and this stuff. sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, and, and, and growing up with that, um, I, I just loved building, uh, you know, pirate radio stations when I was kid. I had a little business when I was 14 <laughs> for, for DJs putting in uh, <laughs> with covert aerials and stuff. Oh, that's like. hilarious. I know. So this is, I just. <laughs> so you were a crook. You were a small, uh, I was a small, small time, time criminal at, at age, age 14. 14. And mm. uh, I had a lucrative business. It was like, I remember getting like 250 <laughs> punt, which was about, I don't know what that would be, probably 200 euro or something. But that was about 20 years ago, Natalie. Maybe more, it would be 25 years ago. I was only 14 or something like so. Um, so, and this, I just thought this was the norm having somebody like this. So credit to my father, like you know, he he put me on this role. But I never ever wanted to, you know, be my mainstay thing. I, I, History is my passion. If you ask me uh, what I'm good at and what my passion is, it's, it's two different things. Now, I have everything fused into one. I mean, I, I've been obsessed with lost civilizations as a kid. Machu Picchu, I think, was the first time I ever remember my intellect being captivated. And I mean that. I mean, I remember at the age of 10 uh, reading the encyclopedia and going through all sorts of civilizations. And the Egyptians didn't even gel with me that much, it intrigued me. But I remember finding the lost city of Vilcamumba, Machu Picchu, and mm. I was totally captivated by it, absolutely besotted. And uh, I just couldn't understand how this city could be lost. And I, and, I, and I remember my intellect being switched on and wanting to know reasons why. So. That's what I love. I love my intellect getting switched on. And yeah, I'm good at the engineering. I've worked as a, a systems analyst, not starting off. I mean, I elevated myself to that, but I worked as a systems analyst in the energy industry uh, all over the British Isles. I was in the part of the British Isles. I've been out as far as St. Kilda. I've been out the Outer Hebrides, Inner Hebrides, uh, the Orkneys, right down to Cornwall. All the Isles, Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, Sark. I've been everywhere across those British Isles. There isn't a, probably an island in the British Isles I haven't been to. As a systems analyst? As a systems analyst. And what I basically would do it to go into electromechanical engineering role. It would be like wind farms or power stations, stuff like that. And I would put the electromechanical systems in. Uh, and that's quite a complex thing. Then they're run by computers. I'm so sure it is a complex so, thing. Um, I mean, I worked in the most automated place in Britain at one point. That was my last job I worked on. 
And I really enjoyed that. And that's why I went to work there, because it was the most automated place in Britain. And when I was finished with that and I went, I want out of this. I don't want to do this anymore. Because I, I, I fed my brain. I, I didn't chase the money. I chased my CV. I chased my brain. I chased the bigger jobs. This job I didn't do. I haven't worked in renewables. I haven't worked in power generation. I haven't worked in water treatment. You know, just so I'd take that job. You know, because I, I, I just I didn't want to be like everybody else at the age of 40. I was looking at all my peers, <laughs> my engineers, and they're all like broken down men, just like their yeah. soul has been destroyed. They just can't face the same job again. I never did that. I just, you know, I was Irish. I was living in Britain. And it's like, they asked me what I travel for work. And I went, I'm Irish. <laughs> it's like, I'm already <laughs> traveling for I have work. a caravan. I'm off I go. And it's like, well, I, I, there was, I remember there was three years running. I did 30,000 miles a year. Because wow. I, I had a car that went, I bought it from scratch and I had 100,000 miles nearly on it when I sold it. Like, but I mean, after that, I just, I kind of filled my belly then, you know, so. Um, so when did you break away from working from other, for other people? I, I, mean, I have a really strange serendipitous story. I, 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 my Australian friend was coming to visit me in Ireland and uh, I brought him, like everybody does, you bring him to the ancient monuments, Newgrange, Noth, Doth. Uh, they're like sister to... Just stone. so you know, not everybody takes people to ancient monuments. Just well, in so Ireland, you know. <laughs> in Ireland, we're very proud of them, OK? Because we have Newgrange, which is, for example, and that's my first book I wrote, the Newgrange Serious Mystery. But uh, it's like, it's older than the pyramids, if you accept the present date of the pyramids. Uh, but it's 3,000... 200 BC, it's got a sunbeam comes in and illuminates the chamber mm -hmm. on the shortest day of the year. It's an extreme feat of astronomy. It's extremely artistic. Uh, it's waterproof for 5,000 years because they put gullies in it and everything. It's like the architecture, the engineering, um, the, the minds that made that were incredibly intelligent people. And we're so proud of it. It's like anybody comes there, it's like we show it off. It's their like prize. So Yeah. Um, and I was doing that and, and he, he asked me some very pertinent questions about some rock art that I didn't know the answer to. And when I don't know the answer to them, I go Google it, I look it up. And uh, I realized something then because at that moment, uh, and this was when I was about 30, so that was about nine years ago. And at that moment, I realized... Um, I realized that nobody was doing it the right way. Nobody was, I looked at all these uh, authors and credit to them, I need these people. Like, you know, I'm not belittling or disparaging people in any way. I mean, I, I credit them. There's Newgrange authors, there's Stonehenge authors, there's, you know, there's authors that just tackle the English monuments or the Irish monuments. No, I just didn't see everybody doing it in a mm -hmm. overview, like a com looking at the complexity of it. And that's what I do as a systems analyst. I, I look at the complexity of everything. I look at the system of knowledge and then I work it down to what's left and what does it mean? You know, I do it the opposite way where people start with some one site and they become an expert on that site and then they see it does it become an expert on another site and there's any comparative and they work it the opposite way. And that's great. We need those people. And I don't pay credit to them. Like, but that's not what I did because I've seen something very special about Ireland. And it's not because I'm Irish. <laughs> so we have 75% of the rock art of the whole of Europe on that island. Mm. And people are begging for answers about megaliths. And they left us a lot of art and it's all in one location. I think we should start where the 75% of the rock art is. Yeah. Not only that, 75% of that rock art, the majority of it is on these mount monuments like Newgrange. For example, West Kennet is another type of uh, chambered mound. Uh, Maze Hill in Scotland, uh, um, you know, so these mounds are all over Europe. The only ones different with the ones in Ireland is a lot of art on them. The ones in Denmark, for example, they don't have any art at all. There's, there's th maybe a thousand across left. What rubbish rocks they what have rubbish rocks in they Denmark. Have. They couldn't be bothered. They don't to even <laughs> have art on them. Like. They couldn't be bothered to carve them. But I mean, it, and that's that's another puzzling question that drove me. Why? Why some have art once, why some don't? Why there's commonalities between, you know, Scotland and Maltese monuments and then the ones in between, like Portugal, Spain, there's, there's not so much commonalities. And it's like, why at the two ends of Europe we have commonalities? You would think, think of in terms of the Romans, where the Romans start in Rome and they spread in all directions, yeah? We don't see an epicentre for the megalithic culture. We see pockets. And it leads you to a very obvious conclusion that they came in pockets. In other words, they came either by boat and they hit various pieces of Europe. You know, it provokes more questions, but you can get insights. I mean, you can't get exact answers, but you can get insights. In other words, they didn't start in Scotland and work down to Malta, or they didn't start in Malta and work up to Scotland. They had to start somewhere. But it looks like, and, and it's a very 
convoluted, uh, you know, uh, answer to give you, but it's it, it, it taking a long time. But it, there's there's lots of different reasons why you can come to this conclusion. You can come it because of evidence of maritime connections. There's evidence of um, synchronous information between the astronomy, the artwork, um, and there is not there is artwork in Scotland. There is artwork in Malta. Don't get me wrong. It's not just Ireland, but it's scattered, and it's like. Okay, so why why everybody has seventy percent of the puzzle, and then there's thirty percent missing in in various parts, though. And it tells you that I, I I personally think, and I came to the conclusion that it's like they're like it's like a refugee by boats theory, where these guys were refugees and they all hit the western. There's evidence of the flood, an ancient mm. flood, and I think and we know that from four thousand BC, just uncovered two years ago in the west of Ireland, there was a massive black layer of silt that wiped out at the west coast of Ireland. Wow. Um, there was tsunamis that hit Scotland in about 7,000 years ago as well, um, probably from a glacier that broke off in uh, Norway as well. So, you know, there's, there's good pertinent reasons why I'm coming to that conclusion. Um, but basically, I, the art was the key thing for me anyway. That was my starting point. And, uh, and I'll come to the serendipity at the moment. But I went on this crusade looking at all this art and I realised that people weren't doing... Uh, processing all the complexity of all the different sites in Ireland in the way that I wanted to as a system of knowledge. You were people just doing pockets of research and becoming their life's work on Newgrange mm-hmm. and there was nobody synthesising the data. Um, the reason I started on the passage tomb, you know, just for people that don't know what a passage tomb is, it's basically a circular chamber it's got a walkway going through or a passageway to a central chamber sometimes there's recesses off those chambers like left, right into the back and uh, it's got a grass-topped mound with some soil and earth or stone sometimes, and it's like a dome-shaped mound, and the s- sunbeam or starlight would come into these chambers and mm. they would illuminate the inside. Now, they don't all have sunbeams coming into them, but a lot of them do, especially in Ireland, usually on the equinox or the solstice, sunrise or sunset. Uh, and a lot of the archaeology wouldn't accept this until, like, about the 60s. And uh, I think it was Michael J. O'Kelly, he first realised that Newgrange is a special light box. It illuminates through this special light box, and it's so ingenious what they did. Um, when, when they first realised this, they just realised the level of intellect that built that monument. Mm. For example, the passageway meanders left and right, therefore blocking the light from behind you, because light goes in straight lines. Mm. Okay, So they hadn't have to put a doorway on it, although there is a doorway there. They didn't have to put the doorway to block the light. But the light box is above the door. How else are, they also made the meandering passage go ascending as well, so that when it ascended, it hit the sunbeam inside. And it's really, really clever. And it's only when you walk through these monuments. It sounds like a nifty real estate trick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're coming in, you get a little ray of sunlight coming well, on you. This end. only happened for 17 minutes, Natalie, of one day of the year. It'd 17 be, minutes. This was like... It'd be a challenge for the realtor. <laughs> it'd be a challenge, all right. Well, let's say that challenge was about 50 years. That took them 50 years to map that out because you would have to see where the sun rises and the sun sets throughout the year. That would give you the, the furthest points. It would give you the equinoxes in the middle and it would give you the solstices, summer solstice, winter solstice. And then from those extremes, you'd have to be relying on the weather every year. What if it was sunny? What if it was cloudy on the 17 and, minutes that you had? Yeah, and you know what it's like in Ireland for weather. If it's known the world over for its rain. Mm. Where I live, it's 265 days of rain a wow. year. So, um, so this is these are, these are the, the you know minds numbing you know. But what would facts. be the point of this seventeen minutes of uh, light coming in? I mean, and why seventeen minutes? Surely that has to be well, significant. Anything from pure astronomy to uh, there was a ritual function where they cremated the remains of the dead outside, and they had them in ceremonial bowls. Maybe they were saying goodbye to their ancestors as the sun came in and took mm. them away. It also looks like from the overhead view of Newgrange, it also looks like a kidney shaped or a womb. And they say it's the sun dagger coming into the womb, penetrating Mm. the womb. There's a ritual function. There's an astronomical function to these monuments. There's an acoustic function. They're they're like Stone Age universities. So I I could, you know, I could do you an era podcast just on each one of those facets. I mean, that's fascinating to me, the part that because they do look like a ton of big rocks, most of them. I mean, I was just at Stonehenge and it's like, okay. And that's the problem, Natalie. They look like a ton of rocks and we we paint these pictures as dummies. I mean, archaeology has this, you know, our ancestors were stupid and we're clever and it's quite the opposite. Mm. I mean, look at what we're doing with our stripy toothpaste and our atom bombs and our, you know, yeah, we've got big fancy telescopes, but 
look what else we do with the technology. We're right. bombing the hell out of Syria and every other country in the world that, for, for chasing oil. It's a low level of intelligence. Right. Uh, it's a low level of uh, consciousness, I should say. You know, so, but these guys in, in the ancient history, I mean, they only took what they wanted from the lands. Right. They, they, they were a maritime culture. We know that from several different points of... Phew, excuse me. So, you know, I'm looking at all this, okay? And Newgrange is, yeah, it's, it's a focal point in Ireland if you're going to study megaliths, as in Stonehenge right. in England. It's a focal point, as is Avebury. But I wanted to know about the other more obscure sites. And then I realised that passage tombs, it might be an obvious statement, but passage tombs have a passageway. They have mm. an alignment. OK. OK. And well, they also have a lot of art on them. Not, uh, what not kind of art? Like little cave drawing kind of scratched actually, in no, art? No, quite sophisticated art. Actually, there's two types of art. One's consciousness art and the other one is astronomical art. Ooh. So they have constellations drawn and they have uh, lunar calculations. They have uh, complex uh, geometric form that I think is most likely representing altered states of consciousness. Wow. Uh, I'll come back to that. So for me, I know that there's two definite representations of uh, constellations. That's Doth Passage Tomb uh, in County Mead, where I grew up in Ireland, and that's got the representation of the Pleiades, and it faces its own image in the sky of the Pleiades on a solstice when it was built in 3500 BC. And the Pleiades is this uh, apparently possible other race that... <laughs> I, I won't go there, but yes, I have covered that on my podcast. But yes, there is apparently races out there from the Pleiadians, the Syrians and, and everywhere else. But uh, people think we actually had these people come to us and give us this knowledge. Mm. But in the astronomical sense, the Pleiades is there. It's on the side of the stone. It's even got metonic cycles, which is a complex 18.6 year uh, lunar calculation encoded into this constellation of the Pleiades. It's mm. a very sophisticated what we would call observational cosmology. In other words, you use your naked eye, you look at the stars, you watch for cycles, you see patterns. L let me tell you about Ardmore rock art. I, I realised something in 2007. I stumbled across uh, Ardmore rock art and I, for some weird, bizarre event, I, I end up in Donegal, uh, across the lock from where I live, by the way. And uh, I, I bought a rare book. It was $150 at the time. I was just finishing my master's. I hadn't even got money to eat. I was eating vegetarian food because that's all I could afford. And Well, I think it's good to eat vegetarian <laughs> food anyway. Well, it's not, not wrong. For me, I've got a high-protein <laughs> diet. I like, to, I like to eat a lot. But um, so I get this rare book. I, I shouldn't have bought it. I didn't know why I bought it. I was like, but it was... Uh, uh, Hamlet's Mill uh, by Hirsi von Decker and Giorgio de Santillano and a lot of my peers uh, they were all reciting this book saying you know this is like a lot of archaeoastronomy all this uh, myth of astronomy and ancient cultures and it's it's a melting pot of ideas and it's uh, uh, it's extremely difficult read but I, I said I'll get it it's like the bible for archaeoastronomy if you if it's a one stop shop for uh, to, to, to I think get... nothing is a difficult read for you <laughs> I just Perhaps feel not. <laughs> well it, as long as it's factual I'm good um, so yeah I, I, I find this book and I get it delivered from America and out drops uh, an article from the New Scientist magazine uh, from July 76 the year and month I was born I'm like wow this is like a bit of nostalgia. Whoa. So synchronicity, and, then, and it's got megalithic observatories. It was a it was a photocopy of this article, and I read through it, and it's got Ardmore rock art, Donegal, and I'm like, I'm looking at my back door across the lock, and that's Ardmore across there, and I'm like, looking around for cameras, <laughs> going, who's playing the trick on me, like, but so I cycle, I like cycling, I cycle around a fifty mile around the lock, and I find the rock art, and in two thousand and seven, it's not in the record. It's not in the record, Natalie. And I'm like so disgusted that nobody has took the time to go and do this. And I felt, you know, if I hadn't been on that journey that moment in time, I wouldn't have been doing that. Right. So I felt a sense of duty to at least, uh, uh, for example, the, the rock art, by the way, is Ursa Major and Ursa Minor on two sides of the stone. And we know them as the Big Bear or the Little Bear or Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. There's loads of names for these uh, constellations. Or the Plough, Big Plough, Little Plough. And it's how we find the North Star today. Polaris. And it's not just that, they also have a notch on the top of the stone. And even at the back of the stone is where you would like to carve it. But they chose the other side mm. with a ripple on it, with a nice natural hairline fracture mm. running down it. 
in other words, dividing the sky between these two constellations. And mm. what happens in that time frame when this Ardmore Rock Art Standing Stone was built, uh, and there is other stuff nearby, is that the two constellations do a flip in the sky every equinox. Mm. Right? That's why I call it the Ardmore Equinox okay. Stone. So they were clearly able to draw constellations and they were drawing these constellations that they were flipping on the sky every 21st of March and 21st of September. Wow. You know, they were showing you some intellectual prowess. And I mean, the, the best real estate is the lock behind you, but they put the art facing the other way. Hmm. You know, so I, I walked to these places and I, that's why I went on a crusade. I, I said, OK, there's something missing in this island. People are putting it together. Take all the data. First of all, gather all the data. That's what I do. Gather all the data and look for commonalities. You might think that's an obvious thing to do. That's what a system No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, people don't do that, Natalie. People just, you know, it's random and chaotic. We have artisans, we have musicians, we have poets, we have mythology people, we have historians, we have engineers, astronomers. Everybody's doing their own skill set. Mine's just a systems analyst. And so I took all the data, and that took me two years, Natalie, to get that data. I didn't make any more revelatory discoveries after that in terms of the, the rock art. I did, but it was more conceptual. So what kind of data were you getting? Uh, well, I sort of all said, art is going to be very indicative of something. It's going to be indicative of constellations and theories and concepts. So I chased all the rock art. That was the biggest, most important. And I also chased all these passage tombs because passage tombs have an alignment. You can get your compass, you can get your astronomy calculations, you, you can look at what they were looking mm. at. So southeast, southwest, northeast, northwest, they're alignments that you would find with the summer and winter solstices. And when you say chase, are you talking, you're looking in hundreds of books or you're travelling no, around I the mean, world? No, I mean travelling around. Well, I these. travelled, I, I, you know, I've mostly focused in Ireland, but mostly around Europe. Around I, Europe. I've been to 550 chambered mounds Good in Europe. Grief. Uh, but that may sound like a lot, but I mean, I did Holland. It does. I did. Like well, I did lot. Holland in three days, and that's fifty-eight tombs. Good grief! I, I am like a maniac. I go like sixteen hours. And I, I mean, I'm I, getting I, it <laughs> full on. <laughs> I don't get me wrong. It isn't a full-on obsession, but it's something I enjoy doing. It's Is that not... your warden outside? <laughs> <laughs> he let me out for the day, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, and the reason I know there's 550 is because I, I know there's like 127 in Ireland. I know there's 58 left in Holland, and I know there's another 250 in Denmark, of which I've only seen about 100. But I mean, most of them are, to be honest with you, no disrespect to Holland, but they, they're quite boring every time you see them. They all look the exact Again, same. Again, the shitty rock formations <laughs> of Holland. I don't, I, why should we hide it? Come on, ancestors of Holland. At least with, with some the carvings in there of some astronomy. They, they, they all look the same, but I, I, I went to, I, I'm like that. I've got three days there. I'm going to see them all. Uh, I'm looking, and I won't let, I won't leave one out because I'm looking for clues and I, everyone is vital to me. What uh, kind of clues? Anything. It, it could be a piece of art. It could be a commonality. Uh, for example, a good example of that question would be Loch Crew uh, megalithic complex. There's something like about 40 tombs left and it's, built over four hills. Um, just so there's not just one mound on top of the hill. There's like a, a main mound with satellite mounds around it. And then there's another mountain here about a, a kilometre away with the same complex again. And there's like over four hills. And they quarried this in the 18th century looking for the entrance, couldn't find it. And there's a nice triangular stone at one end where they didn't dig. And it's diagrammatically opposite this other triangular stone. And I, and I noticed these triangular stones and I'm like, they're diagrammatically opposite each other on the mound and all the rest of the stones are not. It's clearly indicating something. And then there's a standing stone falling over. Personally, I think that's where the entrance is. Will the archaeologists go and dig this up? No. It's the same as another place in uh, Belton East Stone Circle in Donegal where you have these two triangular stones diagrammatically opposite each other. Hmm. Had I not have stood in those two places looking for this mm. with an open mind, I wouldn't notice these commonalities. So... When I look at the Beltany Stone Circle, which was actually a mound at one point, they quarried the whole thing looking for gold uh, quite recently and uh, just destroyed it. And there's a pile of rubble in the middle, but you can see ah. where the chambers were and the chambers are where the triangular entrance stones are. Were these sort of burial grounds there? Because Personally, I think of it like a cathedral. I mean, we have saints and we have people, knights all buried in cathedrals. Um, How can they tear these places up then looking for That was things? the 18th century. For oh. They actually stuck dynamite and blew them up, Natalie. Oh, dear. And they just put big giant holes in wow. the side of them. Uh, not very nice. Um, but, yeah, I mean, passage tombs, 
they tell you an alignment and, and the problem is they're not all southeast and southwest or northeast and northwest or east and west. That tells you all the solstices and equinoxes, sunrises and sunsets. There's another host of monuments in Ireland that are 70 degrees east of north. Hmm. And what's so special about that alignment is, and this is where it gets very conceptual, and this is, these are the questions that are very provoking for me, is that the sun and the moon doesn't get that far north. So it's ruling out the sun and the moon. Hmm. And they were... And it <gasps> leaves the stars. And so we've got all this block art and, and it's got constellations on it. And then you can start cracking some of the theories. You can have a look at what they were doing with some of the lunar. And I mean, for example, there's lunar numbers of 13, 13 months in a year. There's a 19 years in a metonic cycle. And there's lots of lunar numbers. Hmm. And you can see the calculations where they have like notches and they're all counting up to 19. So there's reasons for extrapolating lunar theories. And they're also... You know, another thing they didn't note was they were able to map uh, the sidereal and synodic lunar month. What even is that? It's a complex jargon for the I real... I mean, come on! In layman's <laughs> terms, it's the real month and the apparent month. Basically, if you wanted to map a, a, the, the moon going round in a cycle, uh, its, its real month would be what we call a sidereal month. But don't forget the Earth is turning as you're... Okay. So you have to add on for the little bit of turn of the Earth as well. And that's what you get the... Leap the, year. No, well, you, you, the Earth is revolving. Do you think I'm dumb? The Earth is revolving. <laughs> but comment. I don't understand this. The Earth is revolving uh, a tiny little bit, so it's about two days you have to add on. So if one, one is 27.3 days and one is 29 and a half. Now, we use the apparent month, 29 and a half, because that's the one that we observe. But in reality, it's only 27.3. Why the ancients uh, notes mapped both of them? I, I Personally, I think, why would they choose one over the other? We choose one because it's some cultural function for us today. But I think these guys were just pure astronomers chasing every avenue mm. against the odds with earth and stone. They were putting up monuments made of earth and stone and trying to explore every avenue against the odds. I mean, they didn't have equipment. They had their equipment was earth, stone. No, I mean, how did they even do this? Are you sure they didn't have equipment? <laughs> what about the well, theories of they're... technology that's... <laughs> you know, come well, from other places. Well, I do, I do research ancient technology, uh, lost technology, and I think there's great evidence for that in Egypt and Peru. Um, I've been to both places. I've documented that on Capricorn TV. And uh, I've been out in the field with some people that are engineers and, you know, it's even not too far from where I And if you go to uh, the Petrie Museum in uh, University College London, have you ever been to Petrie Museum? No, I haven't. You've got to go, Natalie. Uh, I just it, know you think that if you, if you go into the, the front door, it's a tiny museum. By the way, William Flinders Petrie, he took measurements and he picked up the, on an engineer and he took up the rubbish of ancient Egypt that nobody wanted. Everybody else was chasing mummies and hmm. he took up all these pottery shards and all the other uh, objects that nobody really wanted. And hmm. he found these drill cores. Wow. And the cores, we have the, the stones with the cores through them and the bits that were removed, wow. we have those cores as well. And he picked those cores up and there's a spiral striation on granites, basalts, high crystalline content that are showing, uh, you can calculate the spiral groove and the diameter and you can calculate the drill rate right. that that went through that it was extremely high, faster than the speed of sound. Ultrasonic drilling through extremely dense uh, hard to carve. We don't know how they could do that. And what do you think? I personally think they had an ultrasonic drill and I think they had a way of doing it with sound vibration. I think they were using sound to do that. Um, how that would happen, I have no idea. I just know that there is stuff there that you can measure and touch that is ex indicative of a high technology. What is high technology? If you look at the megalithic builders of Europe, Ireland or Scotland, England, I mean, it is a high technology, but it's conceptual. If people want something that's really like a, a laptop or a, you know, something like a, a highly engineered device, well, we're not going to find it. You know, we, we have artifacts left. The people want to find the toolkit. You know, they want to find the tools that made this. And if, and if you don't find those tools, uh, well, it doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, there's, there's great examples. There's a place called the Serapium in Egypt. And it was closer 25 years. And I recently got in a chance to see that. And uh, Chris Dunn, a NASA space age engineer, he coached me what to look for when I get in there. And I brought the titanium straight edge with me. And you can put a titanium straight edge on the side of this coffer type box. Uh, I personally don't think it was to house the bulls. They said it was bulls in there. I don't personally believe that. I think they were so over-engineered. But you put this titanium straight edge on it and you shine an LED light on the surface 
and the light will not go through that straight edge. If that's how flat it is. It's within about two thousandths of an inch. Wow. Straight, parallel, flat. And we couldn't re reproduce that surface until we built telescopes in the 1960s. And the ancient Egyptians did it. And we don't even know if the ancient Egyptians did it. It looks like that was from heirlooms from a previous culture. Because the hieroglyphs that are carved into it look like uh, children did it. They they're, they're actually looks like somebody tried to scratch it in with a nail. They hit the crystal, it was too hard, and it jumped. The tool jumped. And not only that, are they perfectly flat boxes on the inside? They're perfectly right angle, and they're perfectly parallel, and they're perfectly parallel that way. And they're all made of 100 ton pieces of granite shipped from 500 miles away. If that's not high technology, Nelly, I well, don't know I what I think it is. <laughs> I mean, the question is, how, how, how do you think they got there? I mean, there's so many theories. Do you think aliens came down and gave well, a hand? You've got to give that theory in consideration when you're looking at stuff like that. And there's another place, uh, I, I could talk Peru and Egypt all day long as well. I, I, I think there, it's not what I write about and it's not what I research about, but it's what I read about as well. And it's what I talk about in the podcast as well. But if you go to the Sphinx Valley Temple, there's 200 ton lintel stones maneuvered into wow. a tight corner. Now, we can get 200 ton, ton lintel stones up and down off the ground. We need a lot of cranes around it. We right. get it up and down, but putting it into a corner, the crane would be in the way. Right. So how did the ancients do it? They put <laughs> this point. They put a 200 ton uh, lintel into the corner, and it's like they, they had some level of technology. It's probably just not what we think it is. It's either going to be sound-based, or maybe they just conceived in different ways. Maybe they were right-brainers. I personally think they were right-brainers first and then left-brainers. They thought in terms of art, music, and technology, and then they thought about the left brain, methodical, technical specifications. I think it was art first, science second. Whereas this culture we're in today is, you know, science first, art second. You know, and that's the left brain culture that we're in. So, but I mean, try telling this to people. It's like an archaeologist. It's you're banging your head off a wall, Natalie. It's extremely difficult to talk to people because they're so locked into a paradigm. And that's what I love about the show. I, I talk to free people, free minded mm. people. I come from an engineering world and I've got my foot in both worlds. I, I like to explore the mystery mm -hmm. and uh, I was always coached to do that as a kid. But it's, it's 20, years, 20 years ago, things changed. 20 years ago, Graham Hancock, Robert Boval, they brought out the, and John Anthony West as well, they redated the Sphinx uh, with the, uh, the water weather ring. They put some great theories together on Egypt. Um, and, you know, from that last 20 years, we've watched a paradigm change very, very slowly. The, the archaeologists still aren't on board. They're still struggling with it. But a few are coming over. I mean, what's the current theory on the pyramids, how they got there and what the purpose of them is for? They won't even acknowledge. Uh, let's talk pyramids, OK? This is how sophisticated let's they are. Pyramids. Let's talk pyramids. <laughs> oh, I the, see. The your, your cheeks <laughs> flushing. The great, <laughs> the great Pyramid is actually eight-sided, OK? It's not four-sided. It's you, you, Most people only see the, the four sides. Right, okay? I thought they were four. But each one of those sides actually has a, a hairline fracture running down the centre of it. It's actually concave. Oh. So that if you look at it from above, it's like an eighth, it's like a like star. Like a star, okay. Yeah. And you will only ever see this on the equinox when the, sh the, when the sun casts a shadow and you see a, th a thin oh. line pointing off it. They put an eight-sided pyramid. It's bad enough building a four-sided right. pyramid. How they got eight sides of a pyramid to meet at the point to an accuracy wow. that is so astounding. It's, it doesn't, if you set down any engineering company on this planet today and gave them the mandate for the Great Pyramid and said, I want you to replicate that, mm. and you had an unlimited bank balance, I don't even think people would rise to the challenge. I don't even think people could accept that as a, as a building challenge and have the skill set to do it. It probably could be done with the greatest effort of the biggest engineering company on the planet. And even then, I mean, it would be a very serious task with all our modern tools. I mean, so, they're aligned, so I believe they're aligned to constellations, right? The pyramids, well, is Greg, that... Robert Boval, the, 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 the Orion con correlation theory, yeah. So they're also mapping the Orion correlation theory, uh, well, the Orion constellation, and that's, that's there too. The Great Pyramid is facing due north within three sixtieths of a degree. That's actually better than Greenwich Mean Time, not too far from where wow. we are today. At, at nine sixtieths of a degree, it's actually three times more accurate than Greenwich Mean Time done with lasers. So... I mean, they, 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 these guys had a level of accuracy. I mean, what's the significance of Orion constellation? If, if it's going it's to be a constellation, why that one? It's always the same, Natalie. It's always Sirius, Orion and, and the Pleiades. These crop up time and time again. Oh, Cygnus the Swan as well. They're always coming up with these same constellations. 
you know, we also have another, I've got to mention the Gebekli Tepe here, because this is the real paradigm buster, because a lot of the archaeologists, although they won't accept all this, they, they, it, it beckons that we had a lost legacy or an ancient culture that had this knowledge. That's kind of passing the book further back and doesn't answer anything. But it's probably what happened, that we have heirlooms from an ancient past. And what we see is survivors of a cataclysm or a flood, um, coming and setting up civilization again in pockets all around the world. 3000 BC was a very active time on this planet. You have the Vedic civilization in India, the Chinese, you have the Olmecs in Central America, in Ireland you have a massive explosion of uh, the Pasolich tombs there as well, and of course Egypt as well. Um, so all around the planet we have 3000 BC, and these weren't supposed to know each other. Or, most likely they all kind of descended from an ancient lost civilization. The ancient Egyptians wrote about this in their own records. Um, but we have Gebekli Tepe, which is carbon dated to 10,000 BC, and it just doesn't make sense in, in any, even, even in a paradigm change. It's like we don't even know. I mean, people that are in the alternative history field we just know that it's what we needed to prove something. At 10,000 BC, we have something like 20 stone hinges buried, maybe up to 50. We don't even know yet. It's all buried. It's actually backfilled back in. How they backfilled it all in, we mm. don't even know. All the stones have exquisite art. They actually reduced the mass of the stones so that the carvings were embossed. So wow. it wasn't like, it looks like they're stuck onto the side of they're it. But extruded. They're extruded. Yeah. Uh, they're showing all sorts of form of uh, extinct animals and uh, foxes and birds and uh, they're all like T-shaped megaliths and they've got alignments and they, so we're talking astronomy, we're talking so maybe ast astrological, cultural function, definitely ritual and we're told that farming came first and then we had too much produce from the, the the animals so we had an overspill so we had commerce and then we had so much commerce from selling mm. off our livestock we developed uh, complex civilization when we could develop complex civilization then we developed religion and that's what we're told and it looks like it's the opposite way around that we have this place 10,000 BC and everything indicates that we had um, at least cultural religious functions first and then complex society where is Gobeki Tepe? Is it? Turkey? It's actually about fifteen miles from the Iraq border in oh. a place called San Lurfa. Uh, so it's eastern Turkey, uh, right on the far east. Okay. Um, I've never been, but I, it, like I mean, if you just look up Gobekli Tepe and look at some of the, I mean, National Geographic finally did a spread on it, and when it when it finally hit National Geographic, that's when it's, it's exploded. And it's here's the thing, and this is why it's relative to Egypt. They dismissed the Sphinx as being older, saying, well. Who built it then? Where is the pot shards of this civilization that built it? Who built it? Where where are they? And that was their answer. That's not that that's irrelevant. If you can't find the pot shards of something, okay, that doesn't mean it's not there. Mm. Like me saying to you, like you know, where's the keys of your car? You don't have a car because you don't have keys. It's Maybe like... these people were really tidy and they <laughs> took their pots with them. These nomadic people. <laughs> mean well i think what, what you're looking at in ancient civilizations the, the earth gets scoured by cataclysms and everything gets washed away i mean that's extremely uh, negative <laughs> that's extremely uh, realistic what about my theory of tidy people <laughs> it's i think it's very nice they were happy reality. people they cleared up and but we have we have the pot shards now and that pot shards is Quebec tepe where we have something so exquisite so sophisticated that the archaeologists are just silent they don't even know what to say about mm. it they, and they won't address it um, unfortunately the German archaeologist uh, Klaus Schmidt he passed away and so there's a lot of confusion who's going to take over and we don't see any sign of any kind of takeover from the German uh, team yet um, so like most of these monuments they go into the hands of archaeologists who don't want to know about it I mean mm. I just came back from Malta and honestly it's so damning over there what they do they don't want to associate the Maltese temples with the rest of megalithic Europe even though Malta and Ireland and the Orkneys are so linked in so many ways with the art the same style of temple the same sunbeam coming mm. in the same recesses the same acoustics they have the spirals they have everything oh it's just like if you look at Scarra Bray and you look at Tarjan temple and you look at Newgrange entrance stone with the triple spiral and you look at all the spirals of Malta, you go, oh, same culture. You could teach a 10-year-old that. A 10-year-old mm. would come up with that idea. But to the Maltese archaeology, get your hands off. They're Maltese temples. Stop stealing our history. Mm. And they're not Maltese. They're, they're Neolithic, you know, yeah. and, and they're a global heritage. But these people, 
no disrespect to religion, but they're run by Jesuits and the Malt Knights of Malta. They're all sitting there pretty much there today. And they have control of these monuments. And it's like the thought police are there. They don't want you to have any other theory on it. And they certainly won't even admit to them being any way linked with the rest of megalithic Europe. And it's, and it's shocking. I mean, I was there to do a documentary and I got harassed. I got like, you know, security would walk past me and literally walk and stumble into me while I'm doing a video shoot. Yeah, that's how bad it is. Like, they just want to harass you because you have an opinion. Mm. When I mean the thought police, I really do mean that. I mean, where were you filming that you were harassed? Like, at the in, monuments. Inside of anything? No, like, just, at, just outside the monuments. Public areas. Yeah, public areas. Mm. Which are right, and which everybody's allowed to do. Mm. But if they think you're doing a documentary, they'll just come and harass you. And I mean, even inside the Hypogeum, which is, by the way, one of the most acoustically tuned, as is the Great Pyramid, by the way, but it's one of the most acoustically tuned uh, monuments on the planet. The mm. Hypogeum is a three story cave system where they found 7,000 uh, skulls with really strange, elongated, uh, bulbous heads. Wow. There may have been another race of people that built the monuments in Malta. Um, there may have been amalgamated with some other uh, beaker people as well. We're not entirely sure, but out of those 7,000 remains, only six skulls remain. They've lost them all or crushed what? them up or chucked them away. I know. It, it, this is what archaeology has done. Archaeology has done more in, to damage in Malta than actual alternative people. Of those six schools that are left, they won't put them on public show. They're kept in the basement. We know wow. that there. We have photos of them. There's one guy with video footage. And they, because it indicates a different theory. It innovates a different, at least, body of knowledge. That's terrible. They even went in and scrubbed off the art inside it. They said, <gasps> okay, because people were questioning actually how old the hypogeum was. Oh, and they my went, goodness. So they went in, scrubbed the art off and said, okay, well, they don't have any more questions anymore, do we? So oh. I know I, and, and this, I, 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 I bad mouth Malta all the time. I <laughs> can't help it. It's like, it's like, it's too easy, but uh, this is true. I mean, they even think Sicilian farmers came over to build the Maltese temples. And the reason they say that is because inside the Hypogeum and other places, they had red, red ochre paint and there's no red ochre anywhere on Malta. So they have to go to the nearest source and they'll only admit to C Sicily. It could have actually, if the could fact have that it, anywhere. it could have been anywhere. Once you get on a boat and leave Malta, it could have been anywhere. Personally, I think there was a, a, a thriving culture between Scotland, uh, Ireland and Malta, stopping off at Gavrinus in Brittany as well. Another massive uh, piece of the puzzle is Gavrini in Brittany as well. And I think they just, sat, they navigated the coastline. It's, it's, if they were on a boat, oh, is that yours? top of the arrow, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Um, if they were on a if they were on a boat, they could have been anywhere. And so they say Sicilian farmers came over and they paint them as dummies. E they even have cartoons, Natalie, right? <laughs> in, in, they have a new museum in Gozo, and I did a little feature on it because I want to portray what what they're trying to do. And they're trying to demonise these people. The archaeology is actually trying to demonise them. So they have like a cartoon of a guy. He's like, oh, I'm a Stone Age man throwing a stone. And he's dressed up like crippled over yeah. and he's got a little loincloth on him and he's hitting his friend on the head with a oh, stone. Wow. And we know that they were dressed in well-manufactured textiles. They had, you know, extremely sophisticated living. Right. You know, they, they even have these strange Neolithic spheres in Scotland that they used fish paste for varnish to, so that they wouldn't... Uh, decay wow. so we know that's this is when we know these were they're not around could, cracking and, each other on the head and they were drawing like sophisticated geometric form mm. i mean some people say the platonic solids i've covered that in a few presentations but i mean these guys were sophisticated they knew complex geometry and they were not dummies like right wow i can't believe that the uh, archaeologists would scrub off a wall i mean i would have assumed that there'd be an archaeologist code where you really preserve whatever you find, and that's your goal. Number well, the, one is, is to preserve it. There is an archaeology code. It's called the Zamet Thought Police. The whole family that took over the Hypogeum is Zamet. The surname is Zamet, and they've been running the archaeology since everybody's surname is Zamet. So it's a family-run business. It's not an archaeology team. Aww. That's the truth of it. And it's like you, you ask anybody for information, if their surname is Zamet or Ferugia, and it's, that's, that's it. They, they, they control it. It's a monopoly. And they answer. I mean, they even demonise the, the the names of the places in there. There's a the hypogeum, for example. They have a like a niche like called the Oracle Hall, and they call, and then the, another room's called the Holy of Holies. And they put these Christian names on these things. They're nothing to do with Christian. They just mm. demonise it, and then they paint out the picture that these guys were 
uh, you know, dummies that they were treading, they had no respect, they were treading over the bones of their ancestors. And we know that they treated them with respect in a ritual sense. They were actually probably going in there having an acoustic altered state of consciousness and saying goodbye to their ancestors mm. in a ritual sense. And we know this, this oracle hole, uh, when you arm or chant into it, only at the male vocal range, that the whole three-story cave system resonates. Wow. And it comes back and hits you in the chest as infrasound. Wow. And to do that, they had to carve uh, apertures instead of doorways. In other words, oval or circular holes into the rooms as opposed to doorways. So that each room is like its own base box in a way, or it has its own resonance. Mm. And at the very bottom, they had a 26-foot deep bass note pit with steps down to it. I mean, how you are with the big rocks is how I am with sound. Yeah. That's my megalith thing. And, wow. and so you saying about the ohm, I, I learned in a class recently in Glastonbury, this mm -hmm. sound healing class with the singing bowls. Oh, yeah. You know, that the ohm, you can recreate basically the frequency of the planet mm -hmm. with a deep voice, probably easier mm -hmm. for guys. And it can help sink your brain into yeah. the planet's resonance. Well, in the passage to Maze Hell in the Orkneys, that, that vibrates about four hertz a second. And anywhere between four, uh, Lock Crew about seven as well. Uh, if you think about beating a drum four times a second, right. or seven times a second, I've done it seven or eight times a second, it's pretty fast. Yeah, obviously. it's hard. Uh, yeah, you don't do it too long before your arm tires. Right. So, but if you can sustain that drumming uh, at least four to seven times a second, you're hitting the theta frequencies. That's the brain waves that right. you go into the altered state of consciousness or the dream state. So these guys were most likely going into altered states, mm. not just with acoustics, but probably with psychedelic compounds as well. Mm. There's evidence for psychedelic compounds as well as the acoustics. And everything you look at these monuments, especially Malta, some of the stuff in Scotland and Ireland, you're looking at these internally as acoustic chambers uh, and externally as the astronomy coming in with either alignment. So that's when I, when I say they were Estonia's university, I don't make no joke no, with that. They really course. were. Yeah. They really were. And, and for example, uh, if you go into a church today, and there's a choir singing. The church is laid out in the shape of a cross. I don't know if you're aware of that. I don't know if people are religious or not. But uh, the way the acoustics is set up in a church today, if there's smoke or incense being burnt or frankincense or whatever, uh, you'll see uh, acoustic waves when the choir wow. is singing. It, it's, it's a weird occurrence. You'll see it, but it's known to happen. And you'll see like a zigzag sine wave. It's called a standing wave. Wow. And that's what happens in any room. The room that we're in now will have its own of frequency. Of course, but we just can't see it. Well, we can't see it and we can't hear it because it's damped by the windows and the curtains and all the stuff. But if, you walk, if you're if you renovating your house and you go into an empty room in your house, you'll hear the acoustics different because mm -hmm. there's less in it. Uh, it. When the sound's hitting the table or it's getting knocked off a, a television or anything, it's just it's altering it. And then it all gets mixed up and damped, what we call damping. So these internal chambers... They've got a complex geometry and sometimes two recesses, four recesses, five recesses. And we even have strange structures that are not explained by any other reason other than acoustics, where you have to step over uh, what I call an acoustic seal. Uh, we have to go down the passage where you step over a little uh, floor step. And what you're doing is you're walking through an aperture. There's no structural reason for it. There's not waterproofing. There's no other reason for it there. Other than it acoustically seals that chamber into segments. Wow. And uh, even the recesses, then you don't walk into the recess. You step over a, a floor seal and a head seal so that you're going through an aperture. And when you have an aperture, you have like the sound hole on a guitar box type of thing. Mm -hmm. that's, what it, that's what a standing note, that's the best way, of, uh, best way of explaining a standing wave. You strike a string on a guitar, it vibrates outside the hole, and that chamber, the, the sound box on the guitar, vibrates. The air inside vibrates at that frequency of that note. So here's the thing. We also have zigzag sine wave art. And I personally think that if they were burning anything like a, a smoke or an incense or anything like that inside these chambers, they would have seen these zigzag sine waves. That's perhaps why they draw them. I'd like to give a practical example why these guys knew about this. Gavrini in Brittany, for example, they have what I call constructive and destructive interference. You can see, Gavrini is, by the way, let me, it means Goat's Island in uh, French, and uh, it's basically a passage tomb. So it's got a sun, uh, it's got an alignment. It's 55 100 years old, 3,500 3, BC. It was actually decommissioned 300 years later, we know that, and sealed off. But outside, it doesn't look as pristine as the ones, some of the stuff in Ireland, but inside, every upright slab on those walls is carved in granite with complex geometric form. And we even have what we looks like waves coalescing with each other. Wow. And as they coalesce, you can see, think of a water wave, two waves coming in, they'll either make a really big wave or they'll cancel each other out. 
And that's what we call constructive and de destructive interference. And that's the same for light, for sound or anything. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what the wave is. So people trying to explain it away, well, maybe it was water waves they were thinking about. But I personally think it was acoustic waves. Sound waves. Yeah. I mean, for me, the fascinating thing with sound is when you look at cymatics, which is making mm. sound visible, you see shapes sure. that I've seen in ancient buildings and sure. in churches. Yeah. Churches always have this sort of four, four sided mm. little flower that looks a bit like a flattened shamrock. Sure. And those Cymatics. are sound shapes. Yeah. I mean, and churches, if it's maybe, you know, a church that's 1500 years old, well, what mm. are they doing with sound then that sure. they were making a shape? Yeah. And then it was so, why was it so important to them, that shape, that they carved it into their structures? And come back to the right brain thing again. And we, we know, like, personally, I think Neanderthals uh, doing all the cave paintings in Lascaux, there's, there's evidence of acoustics going back that far as well. Uh, you have the Pleiades represented there on the bull. Uh, they have a picture of Taurus there, uh, the bull. And on the shoulder, there's a bright spot there. And it's showing you the cluster of stars, the Pleiades. They were showing you, if you just look at it and see mm. animals, you're going to see animals. But they were actually drawing you constellations. Wow. And they were showing you complex constellations. And they also drew a mirror image of it, showing you procession as well. They actually so what's, this, what's the significance, though? I mean, what is the significance of showing us this constellation? They were Well, I think personally, you can look at it whatever way you want. You can look for a deeper mystery or you can say, well, at least accept this, that they drew it. I, I want the most exciting one. The most I exciting one is really. that aliens came and they gave us all the Oh, stars. cool. Yes, that's what I want. But, okay. Yeah, I mean, and personally, I, I don't even care if aliens exist personally. I don't care. Big deal. Get over it. We've got something to get on with on our planet here. Like, you know, stop killing everybody and stay, get on with a more productive means and the human values on this planet. Uh, if there's our little space cousins up there, who cares? They're not coming down to help us, like, so let's get on with what we need to do. That's probably why they haven't interfered with us yet. And uh, I'm wholly open to that. I'm a big deal about it. I don't know what the big, you know, frenzy is, whether you either believe in aliens or not, because it's like, that's where we're at in this planet now. Either people either believe in it and there's like a whole mass gathering of UFO enthusiasts, if you want to call that, not in a derogatory sense, but, you know, and, and fine, get over it. It's not, it's not the be all and end all. It really isn't. And if we are interfered with in our past and, you know, we they're not here now, big deal. Get over it. You know, I personally think there's a lot of human ingenuity can be explained this stuff away. I really do. And I, and I give you that example of this sine wave that there's always a practical reason why something's discovered. Always. So you were saying about then the, the incense in the church mm. and that you could see a sound wave yeah. when the choir sings. Yeah. I mean... I don't know if you've ever been to a Catholic church, by the way, but you, you always get incense burning in there and you'll see sound wave. Like, okay. So they're obsessed with burning uh, frankincense or whatever. So okay. you'll see it there and they always have it laid on the cross. So I, I, not, I'm not into, I haven't been to any other denominations, but uh, I've seen it myself. Like, and, it's, and it's unique to see that. And that's what got me thinking. Maybe the ancients just seen it in that sense too. But I think they were... Right brainers, right back to the Lascaux, Peshmeral, Chauvet car, uh, art, which is like 30,000 BC. These guys were drawing us constellations. And they also have acoustics. I, I wrote this in my second book, The Megalithic Acoustic Mystery, about uh, the paleo archaeoacoustics, which is a big long term, basically. I mean, archaeoacoustics is basically the study of acoustics in an archaeological setting. Mm. And that could be anything. We have bone flutes wow. with a musical scale going back like 12,000 years. Wow. I've seen them in the museums in Austria and Vienna. Uh, we have, you know, we, we actually think now that Neanderthal were right brainers and we've absorbed them into our gene pool. So that's probably not a bad thing to be a bit more right brained. Um, but it, they're very expressionistic and ritual and music and emp emp empathetic and... You know, it's just a different way of living um, and very, very intelligent. They express true art. And I think they were just recording their knowledge in art. Why wouldn't you? Well, that's what we do. We do it in just paper and books today. Mm. We record our knowledge that way. But to in ancient times, of course, you're going to put something down. You're not, not going to not put it down. It's the best way to teach it to your descendants. And the, the connection with the planets again, though, because it's cropping up with uh, alignments of the pyramids to Orion and your stones that have 
inscriptions, which must have been tremendously hard to make, I would mm. think, making inscriptions of constellations. You know, why do you think the planets were so important to them? Mm. Or do you think they were trying to tell future ancestors, hey, guys, you need to pay attention to these planets? And what would the reason be? Well, I think they were trying to tell their immediate ancestors. I don't know if they were thinking in terms of eons or millennia. Make no mistake. I mean, when they built stuff, they, for example, Stonehenge was a thousand years old. I mean, from one stage to the other, at least, and probably a lot longer. I mean, there's, there's dates going back to whatever. I mean, it's, it's guesswork at best, but I mean, they, these guys, we know there's monuments all across Ireland as well. Uh, Carol Moore is 5400 BC and 20 miles away, and that's an Ireland slug over the way. And then 1700 years later, we have Carol Keel, which is another uh, very similar monument. Uh, mm. uh, same type of passage tomb, same alignments, same chambers. and. You know, there's 1,700 years of a gap there. So these guys were thinking in terms of long terms, but maybe they were just, you know, until the Industrial Revolution, we were pretty stagnant for a few hundred years there. So maybe these guys were just in like a thousand year locked into this body of knowledge that was very, very slow to grow. But what you know. were they, what was the deal with the planets? I'm not going to let you <laughs> off this. What was the deal with the planets? I mean, personally, I think they, they I look at it in terms of observational cosmology that all the megalithic monuments, well, actually, before 1500 BC, 95% of the monuments on this planet have astronomical alignments. That's an incredible amount. It's mad that we don't actually look at them as astronomical monuments. Mm. They won't even accept still today that Stonehenge has got some astronomy associated with it. These were astronomical monuments, as were the acoustic monuments. But in terms of observational cosmology, I think they mapped out the sun, which is like northeast, northwest, summer solstice, sunrise and sunset, southeast, yeah. southwest, winter solstice, sunrise and sunset, east and west for the equinoxes, at the latitude of the British Isles. And then I think they turned to the moon and they figured out the synodic and sidereal lunar month. And then I think they found out this 18.6 year metonic cycle, which, by the way, if you look up at the in, in layman's terms, if you look up at the moon at any point on this journey, and you come back 18.6 years later, exactly to the night, you'll see it in that position again. Wow. So that's what the metonic cycle is. It, it takes one at 18 point, and there's a minimum and a maximum of that every 9.3 years as well. And they mapped all that out as well. And then I think they turned to procession of the equinox and they probably were aware of the, the planets as well. But I think they were more aware of the procession of the equinox. I think they knew that the planets were doing something different. Uh, they may have actually mapped uh, Venus. I definitely know when, it, when you look at the Mayans, they were, even going back a thousand years to the Mayans, they were experts in observational cosmology. In other words, naked eye astronomy. They probably knew at the very least that we went around Earth, that is, and uh, Venus went around the sun in a ratio of five to eight. And I'll tell you why that is. They built the uh, El Caracol Observatory it's called El Caracol because El Caracol is Spanish for the snail and it looks like a snail as you go up this observatory but it's basically a, a tower with three windows on it and those three windows are opened up to Venus on an eight year cycle however the base of the monument is oblong like a, a rhombus shape or a diamond shaped uh, platform a raised platform from the jungle floor and the archaeologists that came there to investigate it thought it was, quote, so distasteful that they couldn't build a square base. And that's, oh, my God. But the reason they did was because <laughs> the, the oblong, I know, the oblong base took in the equinoxes. So at the bottom of the monument, it takes in the equinoxes. Therefore, they were able to tie in exactly a solar year on the base of the monument. And they were able to calculate at the top of it, on three windows, the synodic and sidereal uh, periods of uh, Venus. So it, uh, Venus would appear as a morning star for about 260 days and then it disappears for a while comes back as the evening star and then disappears again and comes back as the morning star and it repeats that cycle so I think the synodic period of Venus is about 565 days and for Earth it's about 365 so that, there's a ratio problem there so basically five when I mean, you multiply the equation five uh, Venus years is equal to eight Earth years that's the best uh, calculation so Here's the thing, they had to have known, when you understand all that, they had to have known that we were oh, both the Earth and Venus was going around the same object. They mm. had a basic cosmology. You must at least right. give them that, Natalie. 
that they Well, I might. I mean, I must. might, because you're you so passionate about it. You Maybe they sussed out Venus. Yeah, so, I mean, they, they, they were obsessed with Venus, like. I mean, they weren't, like, they, they, they had it mapped out. They had everything mapped out. They were the master astronomers. They were the masters of observational cosmology. Remind me what the equinox is. Is it longest day in the summertime? The, when days uh, are and night is of equal length. Okay. So 20, usually 21st and 20, uh, 21st of March, 21st of September, although it can alter okay. a day either side. So there's two equinoxes yeah. in a year. Yeah. Okay. So that's um, the March and the September equinox. Okay. And that's hmm. and in the in in the latter year of British Islands, that's east and west. So you're looking. Uh, and that's why it's different. That's why the sun is further north and then further south in the uh, in the winter sun and summer solstice. And why would these be significant then? So it's it's well, purely it, just it, that it, the days it, are the I same personally length. Think that, I personally think that was a navigation thing, and I think it was down to a maritime culture again. In the latitude of the British Isles, what you have is you have a perfect compass wheel. So think of north, south, east, and west, and then northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest like that. So you'll see like every 45 degrees, you'll have mm. an eight-spoked wheel. Mm -hmm. They wrote this down for us. They, they left us eight-spoked wheels. Lock Crew, for example, they have the sunbeam coming into Lock Crew through the passageway, and it hits a solar wheel at the top left. And then it, it, as it rises on the horizon on the equinoxes, only on the equinoxes, it comes down and hits another solar wheel. Mm. And then it finishes on another solar wheel and then it disappears for six months. I mean, do you think it was just how they were able to keep track of time and count months and years to know well, where they were in their life? I, I think it's down to procession. I think if you were to go and look at the stars, if I sat there and you a task now, Natalie, today, and I said, Natalie, go and map out the stars. You would have to start with something. You start I might use a swear word and yeah. then... Okay. <laughs> we'll then I'd have a drink. That. We'll let you off with that. <laughs> well, you would have to start with the most basic thing, which is the sun. The sun rises in the east, sets in the west. Okay. Yeah. And then, it's in, and then it rises in the northeast, so it's changing. And it does a physical heat associated with the mm -hmm. summer as well as a long day. I'm with you so far. And then there's a, f a physical uh, thing associated with winter and a short day. Yes. So you know there's a physical thing going on. Right. Yeah. So... To map out this uh, solar trajectory, basically, you, you can do something very ingenious. And it's a very good question. Starting with the sun, just starting with the sun, it leads you to other things. It leads you down other avenues that something else is going on. Um, so, for example, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, east and west. Eventually, you'll get that mapped out and you'll realize that days of equal night, 21st of March, 21st of September. Mm -hmm. And you can map out the four days of the year, the, the, the crossover between the seasons. Yeah. So 21st of March, we're crossing into summer. Uh -huh. 21st of June is the longest day of the year, the peak of summer. And then you have the peak of... Uh, uh, winter? Yeah, peak of winter <laughs> and the 21st of December. Um, they're not very practical days. Okay, and actually, I'll, I'll give you a great example of this. They're not very practical days. The longest day is not a very useful day. The middle of summer, okay, not the longest day of summer, okay, but you want to know the start of summer and you want to know the end of summer. You want to know the start of, uh, start of the fall and the end of the fall. You want to know the start of winter and the end of winter. The middle of it is no good. You don't want to know the middle point. You want to know the starting point. And there's evidence that they figured that out. So they broke this four days of the year into another eight segments. And this is where it gets a little confusing. Because they have this is where it gets a little confusing. <laughs> because the eight segmented wheel could either be interpreted two ways. They could be the halfway points in a physical measurement of time, and the Celts told us call this the wheel of time. And I'm working for a book in Italian at the moment on this, the wheel of time. That all these cultures around the world call these eight segmented wheels the, the wheel of time. Hmm. However, it's also compass alignments: northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. Well, if you're going to break north, south, east and west, you have a natural compass thing called the sun. I mean, if you wanted to create your own compass, Natalie, all you've got to do is map out the sun for the year, OK? You put a couple of sticks in the ground and then you can know where north, east, north, west, south, east and south. I would hire is. you. You just, just hire me to do that. That would be the easiest way, Natalie. <laughs> but it's, it's not, in, honestly, it's, in layman's terms, it's not a difficult thing to do. You put a couple mm. of sticks. That's probably what standing stones and stone. A couple of sticks. A couple okay. of sticks in the ground. And then you have a standing rows of stones. That's what these alignments are for. They're mapping out northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. And then when you have a compass alignment, it's actually got some time associated with it because mm. time is mapped out with these halfway points, the start of summer, start. It's a double, you know, double revelation. Well, I guess 
you can read the time by the behavior of the light angled we, we on actually, the rocks, right? We actually have uh, evidence of the rock art in Ireland. Again, this is what's so revelation about the rock art in Ireland. We have two examples of this, not just one, but two. In Loch Crew and Noth uh, passage tombs, where we have a 16 month calendar that they mapped out the north, south, east, and west, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. And then they realized that that has got some time associated with it. There's physical quantities of summer and winter and spring and uh, fall. So then they probably further broke that again from 8 into 16. So we have what we, what we call like the sun with 16 rays on it. And then we have 22, 23, and 24 day counts at the end of every ray. So they had a 22, a 20, a 22, and a 23 day month. Like we have 28, 30, 31. Mm-hmm. They just did it a different way. They did 16 months. It's, it's arbitrary how many months you put right. in a year. So we put 12 in it. You could also do it with lunar months, like there's 13 lunar months in a year. So it, it, what it leads to is a breakdown of measurement of time. But just by mapping out what the sun is doing, mm. you're led down this avenue of mapping time. And then when you're mapping time, it's like, well, how do we map time? What do we call time? What is time? And it's getting into a philosophical. So the measurements and the observations and the calculations were, you could say, crude with stone, but they're also very, very revelatory mm-hmm. in terms of the time frame. So if you map out the solar year and then you start mapping out, it leads you to the moon then. Well, let's map the moon as well. And then the moon is very complex. I mean, they actually could pinpoint that moon anywhere on this journey, Natalie. For example, in the Outer Hebrides and Callanish, I've been there. I lived in the Outer Hebrides as an engineer for the water industry. And I had the pleasure of seeing that. I wouldn't have made the, the, the trip there. It's a remote place and it's like 40 mile an hour winds on average. It's terrible to live there. But uh, up there, the moon does something very different because it's at latitude 60, I think, something like that. And it's very, very further north. So the further, I mean, in Malta, for example, the moon's overhead. And Mm. then in Scotland, at latitude 60, 62, it's almost on the horizon on its metonic Mm. cycle. So the moon looks like it's bobbing on the on the mountains at a very, very low on the horizon. Like a karaoke ball. Yeah. Going it's, up it's, and actually, down. it's actually a little uh, feat of uh, engineering or to mine these monuments to this metonic cycle, but it's also like a little display. Like, it's like a little prowess or well, a display. F- for listeners who can't see, that's what you just did with your hand, it moving it up and down, no. and it just looks like the little karaoke no, ball. When you're and, it's, and it's on a mountain range, and then it stops dead centre on a megalithic monument, which is like crosshairs, it's like a cross with a circle in it, okay. almost like a Celtic cross, and it's aligned to the metonic cycle. It's also aligned to the Pleiades in its east direction as well. So All these sneaky Pleiades, they're and getting in there the, and again. There's, and there's the thing, think about this, by using the solar mapping of the year, and there's evidence that the whole of Loch Crew was a solar mapping complex, in other words, breaking down the solar year into m- units of time, four major days of the year, then eight days, and then halfway again into 16, and into manageable months, and, and, and trying to develop a calendar. The, the Mayans had about 15 calendars. I don't know, I mean, they're just like, they had calendars for the human gestation period, they had calendars for the moon, they had calendars for living, they had calendars for reproduction, they had calendars for astronomy, they had a 54 a metonic, uh, a triple metonic calendar. It, it was just complex in their calendars. It's how you want to design your calendar and for what purpose. Is it the Mayans who sussed out that the world goes on this 26,000 year trip? Or was that Sumerians? Well, everybody might have done it. Everybody well, well they, did it, it. they did it accurately. The Mayans, because it is almost, it's just under 26,000 yeah. years. And I always did kind People of wonder, actually maybe how think, did you figure that out? Uh, 25,920 years is the processional cycle, at okay. best calculation. And All right, fancy pants. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, shy of it. Here, but <laughs> but um, yeah, no, they mapped it accurately. But there's evidence that they were aware of it in the megalithic builders in Ireland. I've, that's what I've alluded to, that I think they knew about it. I just think they just tried to calculate its rate. It's basically 72 degrees. Uh, sorry, every, one degree of precession is 72 years. So a human lifetime, every 72, uh, every 72 years, you have one degree of precession. Wow. And eventually you'll go 180 this way and 180 back. Because it's a wobble. Now, yeah. the thing is, if you were to go and do any astronomy that's more advanced than solar mapping, or stars, for example, because you have summer constellations and winter constellations, this is where it gets practical, and this is where it makes sense to people, because you would want to do it on the same day every year. There's no point looking at the constellations in March and then looking at them in October, because they're all different at different times of the year. However, they do repeat every year except for the processional cycle, which is when you get to 72 years later, it's mm. all off by one degree. 
So I think when you want to look at constellations, you're going to have to look at the same day every year. And what days do we have? We have equinoxes and solstices. It was like Swiss watch mm. observers. Okay. Uh, it was like Swiss watch precision for doing observatories. So you want to go and look at the constellations and you want to see is there anything different every year? Well, you're going to do it on, let's say, the 21st right. of March. Let's pick the March right. equinox. Compare apples with apples. Apples with apples, okay? And then... If you had a row of standing stones, which they did, mm. they had lots and lots of rows of standing stones and pointing them to stars. After 72 years, that star is off by a degree. Right. And you're looking at it on the equinox every year and you know, hang on a minute. And then another 72 years is off another degree. Another 72 years. Off. After, th- after 216 years, it's off the width of the moon. The width of the moon is about three degrees on the horizon. Hmm. So it's appreciable, even in three lifetimes. So these guys were leaving generations of monuments to each other. They must have known about procession because you don't have to go a whole 26,000 year cycle to know the procession is there. You'll need to go a little bit to see that it's, the effect is taking ticking in. I mean, I know that there wouldn't have been so much in the way of entertainment back then and distractions because we have a world of distraction now. We have, I mean, there was no such thing, I'm sure, as celebrity I, back then other than monarchies and your king and stuff. <laughs> But why the obsession with the planets and the moons? Well, uh, you know, think think about that for a second. I mean, I think they were probably so obsessed that it was all they were. It was everything they were. I mean, the 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 enormous effort just to build these things. I mean, to to take the stones hundreds of miles from quarries and arrange them in such a way. I mean, if you actually were to calculate the man hours for the twenty five thousand plus site uh, sites across Europe, just do the man hours on it. I don't think anyone's ever calculated. You know, you probably could. You'd have to know exactly what they were like in pristine condition. But it was such an enormous effort. It was probably the be all and end all of your life. It probably, um, there was probably no. That was your fun. There was no fun time or downtime. I mean, as you, know you mean? say, with uh, Stonehenge, it took so many hundreds or thousands of years to come to its. It must have been like it's magic, fine. Natalie. Imagine I turn around to you in prehistoric times or Neolithic times and say, "Hey, Natalie, I can tell you where that moon's going to be in about ten years." You're like. No, you can't. I'd say Whatever. I would be you're impressed on the ju- you're on if the ju- you could do that. You'd probably say you're on the jungle juice or something like, you know, you get, get off that And sauce. maybe you would be. I probably would be. You'd have sussed all that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, and if somebody did that, it would have been like It would have been impressive, yeah, to say here's the moon's going to shine through this little hole in this rock. Yeah. And, and I'm going to bring you. Would that have been powerful to the point that it was intoxicating for people to follow? And Yes, and, yeah, then you, they would think you were somehow a wizard, I guess. Yeah. So you've got to look at it like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I say... I, that I would be powerful. I, 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 I liken these people to like astronomer priests or astronomer shamans. They were like right. a multitude. They were polymaths. Uh, you know, they were polyhistors. They were sitting there with all this knowledge, the acoustics and shamanism and the, uh, the astronomy. It was all one science to them. We, we compartmentalize today. These guys had it all. And they must have been like druids or something like, you know, that's what druidism probably was. They were able to predict all this. I can't help but think of some guy next to the rock with the hole in it who's like, and now, and he's waving his arm like a magician, and, and he says a fancy word, you know, chal as well, and then the beam of light comes That's through. True. That could be very impressive. Well, imagine that for Newgrange, I mean, because the, the sunbeam literally illuminates the chamber and then it disappears. I mean, that was Swiss watch precision. You could make up all sorts of stories as well. You could say our ancestors are going to visit us in a beam of light right, right now. You could I mean, say anything. And I mean, who's going to go, well, that's not right. Certainly inside the chambers, it was like that. I mean, uh, uh, if you're looking at the moon on the horizon like Kalanish and then it stops and it lines with the monument, that'd be one thing. But to have the sunbeam come in and you know it every year, I mean, they must have been able to know it was getting close. They must have been, OK, you know, you didn't have, they didn't say like it's the 21st today. <laughs> it's like, get, these, get ready. Did these people just have way too much time on their hands? Well, you know, Here's, here's this is how complex it is as well, Nelly. Okay, so I, I told you about why you would observe on the equinoxes and the solstices. They even did it to the hour of the day. And how they did that was a thing called the heliacal rising of a star, which is an astronomical term is basically whenever a star or an object or whatever, or even the moon, when an object comes up on the horizon, uh, on the horizon and it's, for example, say Sirius, for example, is a rising on the horizon. Any star, anyway. Uh, it's coming up on the horizon, and it gets quick. The sun's arising as well. It gets quickly drowned out by the sun. The Egyptians worshipped this, and they call that the heliacal, helios meaning the sun, the heliacal rising of that star. So in other words, it gets, it rises, it's still nighttime, and then the sun comes up quick, very quickly and drowns it out. Mm. Okay. 
Well, we have stuff at Doth, Passage Tomb, and uh, the Temple of uh, Dendera as well, where Sirius was aligned to the heliacal rising. In other words, they were obsessed with this heliacal rising business that as soon as the star came up on the equinox, in other words, they knew that day of the year, it was a special day for observing. Well, then, as soon as the star came up, it gets drowned out by the sun. Well, they're observing at the same time of the same day every year. Hmm. to the minute they right. might as well have had a watch right normally. and we have examples of heliacal risings that that was important to them because they knew they were observing on the same day of the year they must have known they were observing at the same time every year and if you knew you were observing at the same time every year you were you were, you were letting the the natural heavens do the accuracy for you hmm. you didn't it's like it's ingenious like. <laughs> Yes, it is ingenious, I agree. I did have to break there. I know it's a bit abrupt, but I had to cut somewhere. But don't worry, James is going to be back next week with all new topics from today. That's how much stuff this guy knows. Special thanks again to James Swagger for taking time out to meet in London as he wraps crazy filming schedule on his documentary series Megalithic Odyssey, which you can check out at megalithicodyssey.com. And as always, I'll post a link to that at thegreyescape.com. By the way, when I was noodling around the internet this week with my own fascination of sound, I stumbled upon a paper on acoustic levitation methods. That is moving stuff with sound. Guess who it was written by? NASA. And guess what? They levitated. Drugs. They were moving drugs with sound. Like crazy, the imagination runs wild. So I'll post a link to that publicly available paper from NASA at thegrayscape.com in case you want to conduct your own experiments with some aspirin or coffee or an ingredient of your choice. Thank you, as always, for listening, you guys. I love meeting these people. I love bringing their knowledge and insights to you. If you're enjoying these episodes... Please take a moment to post a rating, maybe even a little review on iTunes. And you can email me at contact at thegrayescape.com, gray with an A. Come say hi to me on Twitter, Twitter at that Natalie Gray. I am really looking forward to being back with you guys next week for more James Swagger with talk about Chinese astrology, quantum physics and those naughty electrons, sacred numerology. Scalar energy, and you know who that means, your hero and mine, Nikola Tesla. Who can get enough of him? Certainly not me. Can you imagine how great that episode's going to be? So off you go. In the meantime, do an experiment with acoustic levitation. Go float some Tylenol. Take care, everybody, and I promise to miss you, even though you're right here with me in this exact same spot in the quantum field. That's all for now. And I'll catch you next time on The Grey Escape. 